Well, just a short while ago, I spoke to the UN Under Secretary General Philippe Dusbazi, who's also the former French Foreign Minister. He's just been to Lampedusa to meet migrants, and I asked him how alarmed he is by what he had seen. You know, I went to Lampedusa and uh, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea for ten days, and um, for example, last Tuesday we went with Italian coast guards to rescue a boat. 320 people on the boat. We opened the bottom of the boat and we discovered 50 dead bodies asphyxiated by the gas of engine. So as, a, as a human being, let alone a, a campaigner, what did you think, what did you feel when you saw that? You know, I think that it's absolutely a shame to hear only populists about this issue. You know, we have to, to come back to the Second uh, World War to see this kind of atrocities. It's, it's a terror in the eyes of these migrants. Uh, the sea, uh, the, the sunburn are often fatal. And when they start from Libya, they cannot move on this boat. It's impossible. They have to excrete in their place. And a lot are dying. And two hours after, we went to another boat. Three dead bodies in the boat. And I saw, I saw personally, six people who were drowning. Clearly, these people are desperate to even make the journey. How difficult is it to actually try to determine, once they're on land, whether they are economic migrants or fleeing for their lives? Or does it make no difference for, for someone on your position? For me, the only cause of all of these problems is the extreme poverty. You have two billion people in the world who earn less than two dollars a day. We cannot continue like that. It's not possible. So we have to fight extreme poverty. I know that we have a lot of refugees from Syria, Somali, Eritrea and, uh, and Syria, of course. But don't forget that you have a vicious, vicious circle. Extreme poverty allows to corruption, allows to conflicts, allows to civil war, allows to extreme poverty. And when you see the way Europe has responded, you see razor wire fences put up in Hungary, what is your response to that? You know, all the European politicians are on the short term. I can understand it's very difficult. I know that we cannot take in all the misery in the world. We, I know that this migrants are going to increase racism and xenophobia. I know that these migrants are going to destabilize the West. But who can say that we have to let them down is not possible. The only solution is to fight extreme poverty. The, the French Foreign Minister described uh, the Hungarian tactics as, as scandalous. Uh, I mean, uh, as someone in your position, uh, you talked about shaming when you saw those scenes on the boat. Responses like we've seen from, from Hungary, do you find that understandable or, or are you ashamed by that as a response from a country? The wall, this wall, at the border of Serbia and Macedonia is a shame for me. I want to go there to say that, and I, I, we launched a petition online today on change.org, global unity, because it's impossible to do that. We have to, to create new sources of finance to fight extreme poverty. We have a Hungarian MEP coming on the program. What would you say to him in terms of the way his country is approaching this crisis? It's. Uh, a, a populist uh, reaction is impossible to I, I am ashamed to belong to an international community which can you know save these people to accept that we have to avoid 
these migrants. And the only possibility, the only solution to avoid to, the, the, these migrants come to Europe is to fight extreme poverty. Are you also ashamed when the country. Slovakian Prime Minister says, and I'll read you the quote, we will wake up one day and have 100,000 people from the Arab world, and that is a problem I would not like Slovakia to have. He was talking there specifically about th the proposals of quotas to different countries. Does that make you also ashamed when you hear a quote like that? First, yes, of course, but, you know, <laughs> We have to work, our duty as politicians is not to work in a short-term policy. We have to work for the next 10 years because we have a wave of 40 centimeters now. But the wave is going to be a wave of 30 meters, a tsunami wave in uh, 10 And we've years. seen that with the numbers growing yes. even in, in this year. But as a solution, when so many of the EU countries cannot make any sort of basic agreements, a huge amount is at stake at this meeting coming up in a few days' time for leaders. What is the barest minimum that they actually have to, to put forward and agree on, do you think? I appeal to President Obama, to all the heads of state in Europe, for the G20, for example, to make an international conference, to decide a Marshall Plan for sub-Saharan Africa to give drinking water, sanitation, food and health So and it's a plan on that sort of scale, the Marshall Plan that's required. I mean, you have a gathering of EU leaders, but even that, you think, is not enough? Absolutely. We, we need to have finance for this Marshall Plan because we are going to have a very nice General Assembly of the United Nations, a very good agreement with all the heads of state, but where is the money? We don't have Final quick thought uh, and brief thought. If they fail to come up with very much that's substantial at this next crucial meeting, what are the consequences? Uh, the consequences is very simple. For our children, you are going to, to, to see millions and millions of people from developing countries because the globalization of the communication, internet, TV, are there. Everybody can see everybody. So we cannot continue But the like opponents that. say it is fine perhaps to take asylum seekers, those who are in fear of their lives, but not economic migrants. That is not what the EU has been set up for, a free movement simply for economic reasons. Where are they wrong? <laughs> I am ag against assistance, ec economic assistance. But if you die before the age of five, you cannot go to school and you cannot enter into the economy. So we have to give these global public goods, drinking water, food, health, education, sanitation. If we do that for each human being, for the dignity of each human being in the world, we are going to succeed. Final thought, because the UN has already said back in May, the small number of places that uh, Europe has put forward in terms of quota is wholly inadequate to the magnitude of the crisis. Do you think Europe and its leaders, as we speak now, have actually understood, acknowledged the scale of the crisis that they're actually facing? Yes, yes absolutely. I can understand that Angela Merkel and, Jung and Juncker, Jean-Claude Juncker, has to manage you know, the flows. And I think that we have to share the flows, of course. But it is a short-term policy. We have to understand that we cannot I ask a lot of migrants when I was there, uh, you know, S Senegalese people, uh, people from Ivory Coast. You don't have any war in these countries. Why do you take the risk to come to Europe? Because my uncle, I have an uncle who is taxi driver in Oslo or taxi driver in London. I want to do the same thing, to have money, to save my life to give money for my father, for my mother. So you cannot manage that if we don't have financing, funding to fight extreme poverty. Well, that was the UN Under Secretary General speaking to me just a short while ago. And as I was saying to him uh, here in the next hour, I'll be speaking to Georgi Shoplin, who's a member of the European Parliament from Hungary's ruling party for their perspective on this uh, European 